Hey, good morning, good morning. morning. Welcome to Portsmouth Christian Church. What a great day it is being in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. Got a couple of people watching um, online. We got Miss Bridget uh, coming back from Florida. Um, I think it's at the airport, so uh, we want to um, wish her safe travels. Um, also, Heather Meadows um, woke up this morning with a migraine, so uh, we want to uh, just pray for her and and uh, acknowledge um, her sickness and uh, know that she is missed and loved. And um, a couple of calendar events we got coming up. Um, Adult Sunday School resumed next week. Lonnie still didn't make it back, so uh, we will be having um, Sunday School next week and uh, February 5th at 9.45. Uh, small group this Wednesday night, February the 1st at 6.30 as we continue to study the book of 1 Corinthians. Ladies Bible study, it will be this Thursday night, uh, February 2nd at 6.30. Uh, please come and join the ladies for that. Um, also, if you have a child that attends here, we need you to fill out a City Light um, Kids Form registration so we can get them in the system. Uh, we have a brand new check-in system. As you know, today uh, you, they're giving you out these uh, uh, tickets that have your kids number on there every week they will get a different number uh, you have to match that number and you say well Tim we've only got 40 some people here what do we need that for we're not going to stay at 40 some people we need to get it right we need to practice it now so that we can get it right when the time comes also the ladies and jam girl, uh, girls potluck is going to be after church on February the 26th directly after the church service if you would like to come, please sign up on this and um, sp- uh, put something that you would like to bring. And let me say something to you. If you can't afford to bring something, that's okay. Come out anyway. We would love to have you. But we do need your name on the sheet so that we can kind of figure out how many to prepare for. Also, Vacation Bible School, we need people still to sign up. We have a lot of slots left on here, guys, for people to volunteer for um, the uh, Vacation Bible School. So please... Um, sign up for those things so that we can make sure that our Bible, Vacation Bible School is a, a success this year with a lot of excited kids who learn about Jesus Christ. But we need your help. Also, uh, last thing, the Jam Only will be having a uh, pizza cook. They're, they're going to make their own pizzas. How about that? Um, it's going to be on Saturday, February the 11th from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. It is no cost to you or your child. Uh, Please come out. It is for our middle school and high school kids. It's going to be lots of fun. They're going to be doing games, and they're going to be making their own pizzas here at the church. So invite somebody. If if your uh, teenager has a friend, get them to invite somebody. Let's get kids here who want to do exciting things at Portsmouth Christian Church. Let's show them that we are a thriving church who loves the Lord, but we still like to do exciting things. So again, that is February the 11th, which is a Saturday, and it's from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. If your kid is going to be in it, you need to sign the participation form and give it to either Mandy or Jason, and we appreciate you doing that. This morning, I want to talk to you about keeping your eyes focused on Jesus. How do we do that? The Bible says that in order for us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, we have to have a continual relationship with him. We have to pray. We have to read our Bible. We have to talk to him even when we're not praying. Right now, we're doing our 90-day challenge where uh, last year, I didn't circle the listening to Christian music every day for 90 days. The reason I didn't is I'm not very fond of today's Christian music. Um, I like the older type music, but I said, you know what? I'm all in this year. So this year I circled the one for Christian music, and let me tell you something. It's been amazing listening to some of the music that I haven't listened to in a long time and listening to today's music. There is some good music out there, and um, it's been exciting. It's uh, helped me draw closer to God because when I'm listening to Christian music on my bus, if I'm listening to it in my car, it helps me to draw closer to Him. And that's the whole goal. At the end of this 90 days, when we finish this challenge, we need to be more spiritually mature than we've ever been. Are you going to open that? <laughs> I'm, only kid- I'm only kidding. Open it. <laughs> I saw you look at me. Go ahead. <laughs> that's okay. You open it, girl. 
Yeah, yeah. Just knock over pans and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Look in your pocketbook for pens and knock over pans and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, today's scripture we're going to be talking about is Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, and it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great, uh, great clouds of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that is so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And actually, what it's about is, it's about how the Spirit tells us to focus and to continue to focus on Jesus. Scripture tells us that to keep our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I'm going to give you a little example of how that faith works when we put our eyes on Jesus. You've all heard the story, but I'm going to tell it again. Peter. Peter's in the boat. There's a storm. The waters are raging. And they see somebody coming at them, and they say, oh my gosh, it's a ghost, and they are afraid. And Jesus says, do not be afraid. It is I. And Peter says, Lord, and if it's you, let me walk out on water. Now, that takes a leap of faith to be able to get out of a boat and know that you're going to do the same thing that Jesus does. But what does Peter do? He focuses his eyes on Jesus. Jesus says, come out. Peter takes that first step, and I bet he's <laughs> tapping just to make sure. I would be because I can't swim, so I don't even know if I'd do it. I'd have to have a life, you know, one of those rafts around me and all that kind of stuff. But but he focuses on Jesus. He's got his eyes on him, and he says, I'm going to do this. I know I have faith in Jesus because I have my eyes fixed on him. So he takes that step out of the boat, and he says, man, this is awesome. Look at what Jesus has helped me to do because I have faith in focusing on him. And he starts to walk. And then what happens? I believe the devil says, you know what? Mm -mm. ain't going to work like that I'm going to cause the wind to blow and I'm going to cause the seas to roar and you're not going to like it Peter so all of a sudden the seas start going crazy and the wind starts to blow what does Peter do he looks down and takes his eyes off of Jesus so therefore he doesn't have the faith because he's not focusing on the pioneer of faith and that's Jesus Christ so what does he do? He starts to sink. Why? Because he took his eyes off of Jesus. You see, we keep our eyes on Jesus, and we're doing this challenge now so that no matter what we do, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're focusing on Jesus. Because when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we start uh, focusing on other things, we start to think of things that are not godly. Jesus says, focus on me. But here's the good part about it is, is when Peter starts to sink and he says, my Lord, my Lord, I'm sinking. He puts his arm up. What does Jesus do? I got you, Peter. And he pulls him right back up. That's what Jesus does for us. You know, sometimes I know that when Paul says, when I want to do good, evil's right there with me. So when I want to do good and I want to focus on Jesus, sometimes I take my eyes off of my Savior and I start doing things that I want to do. And Jesus says, no, 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 Tim, you got to reach up. So I reach up and he says, I got you, Tim. You see, we stay focused on him, but even when we don't, he's there to grab us when we start sinking. Why? Because he's a loving God who doesn't want harm to come to us. He says, I have a plan for you, a plan for you to prosper. Now, that doesn't mean you become a millionaire. That doesn't mean that you have a big fancy house or a big fancy car. What that means is, is that you'll have eternal life with Jesus because you've run the race and won. I wish I could tell you about an inspirational story about a time I won a race. But I think the greatest story I have ever have is during rookie school and fire department, I had to run a mile in less than 12 minutes, and I did it in seven minutes. To me, that was a history-breaking event, and um, I probably couldn't run it in 24 hours right now. But um, <clears throat> I want to tell you a story about an inspirational runner, and his name is Glenn Cunningham. At seven years old, Glenn Cunningham and his brother Floyd were badly injured in an explosion. 
Floyd perished from his injuries, and Glenn's legs were so badly burned that his doctors wanted to amputate both legs. He had lost all his toes on his left foot, as well as muscle and ligament damage that destroyed his transverse arch. Glenn's parents refused to let the doctors amputate, even though he warned them that their son would probably never walk again. That happened in 1917. It took two years before Glenn could walk again. And eventually he was able to run. And Glenn Cunningham rep represented the United States in the 1932 and 1936 Olympic Games. Over the course of his career, Cunningham set a world record for running the mile. He almost did it in four minutes. He also set the world record for the 800 meters in 1936. Why am I telling you this story? Some preachers would point to Glenn Cunningham's great determination and effort to encourage you to greater spiritual discipline while you run the race. Like they'd say this, if Glenn Cunningham could set a world record with his burnt up legs and missing toes, then what's your excuse? Cast all your sins. Read your Bible and pray more. Be more diligent and get running to Jesus. But that's not my point here today. My point is, is that I'm not here to try to goad people into doing things they don't want to do. Even if I wrap it up with a little inspirational story, that's not the point. <clears throat> Think about this, guys. How many of you have gone to the dentist for years and what do they tell you? Floss every day. How many of us floss every day? Oh, there's always one in a crowd, ain't it? <laughs> Yeah, I understand. <laughs> and it's been my experience that people listen to pestering from their preacher about as well as they listen to their dentist. Even when the pestering comes with a pep talk about some inspirational person. So now what am I going to do with this story? Why did I tell it to you? Here's why. We're all Glenn Cunningham when it comes to running the course of faith. And I don't mean Glenn Cunningham when he's winning the Olympic medals and setting world records. I mean Glenn Cunningham in 1919 when he just learned to walk again. Amen. Or maybe making our first feeble attempts at running again. We're all going at different speeds. But the point is not to compare ourselves to other runners, and we do that often. If I only knew the scriptures like such and such. If I could only pray like such and such. Oh, man, that person is so inspirational. If I could just be like that. Stop comparing yourself to other people because I guarantee you the ones that you're comparing yourself to, you will never meet their expectations. <clears throat> but guess what God says? Do your best. Give it all you got. Even when you don't know how to pray, pray something. Even if it's just, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Pray something. You know, the Bible even talks about those who say long, long prayers trying to impress people. The Bible says, don't do that. Don't do that. We're not here to impress people. We're here to glorify God. Amen. Stop worrying about how you pray. Stop worrying about why well, I can't read very well. Read as you can. Get a Bible app on your phone and let it read to you. You see, we can all make ways, but we don't because we want to make excuses. You see, Glenn Cunningham could have made an excuse, couldn't he? My legs are burnt up. I don't have any toes on one foot. How am I supposed to run? No, he ran the race because he persevered, and that's what Christ tells us to do. Persevere and run the race. Amen. It's not the start line and goal. It's the end line and goal. You see, we're all like Glenn Cunningham and another reason because we've all been burned by sin, haven't we? Our own sins and the sins of others. And we have deep debilitating scars in our lives for the sins that we've endured. And now we find ourselves in the great race of life and faith when we shouldn't be walking, when it's a miracle that we're even alive anyway. We're found with the faith and the grace of God. And you're going to find out, and I can promise you this, that the only way 
we're able to even limp or walk through this thing called life is with fixing our eyes on Jesus. We will not do anything on our own. I can promise you, you will not overcome the smallest of obstacles without facing and fixing your eyes on Jesus. Because I'm here to tell you right now, we're not as sly and as cunning as the devil. Never will be. It wasn't meant for us to defeat Satan. You may not believe that, but it wasn't meant for us to defeat Satan. It was meant for us to rely on Jesus to defeat Satan. That's where we're at. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that I will not defeat him unless I put on the full armor of God. I will not defeat Satan walking right up to him by myself. I have to put on the full armor of God. So we need to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Looking for the finish line. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, we just read that. Pictures Christians running an Olympic style race in the great Colosseum. Think about what verse 1 says. We're surrounded by such great clouds of witnesses as we run the race. I told you one last week about the Olympic runner that had took hours to run the marathon because he had fallen and hurt himself. And the people applauded louder when he came in than they did for the winner. Why? Because he finished the race. When we finish the race and we take our last breath, our Jesus comes back and we go before heaven. What a celebration that's going to be. It's going to be amazing that when we walk through the clouds and and they say, now introducing a great Christian, Tim, and you walk through and everybody claps and and then Stephanie and and, and everybody else that comes through and they're going to clap. Why? Because we finished the race. We persevered through the difficulties of life. We kept our eyes fixed on Jesus so we had the faith to finish the race. Who is the multitude of witnesses? And I love this, man, because I call it not the Hall of Fame, but the Hall of Faith. People like Noah, Abraham, Sarah and Rahab, Samson, King David, and not to mention all the other thousands of people that are there that we don't even know. They persevered and they won the race. They're all witnesses Because every one of their lives bears witness to saving faith. They kept their eyes focused on Jesus. Can you imagine what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? When the king says, turn it up. Higher than it's ever been. And I can hear the king telling them now, what do you think about that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what do you think? And they said, I don't care. Because I'm okay. If God goes in there with me, I'm okay. If I die, I'm okay. Guess guess what? I'm going to be with him in eternity. They didn't care. So when they were in there, and the king looked in there, and he said, I thought you put three in there. God said, you did. But I'm right here with him. Why? Because they had their eyes fixed on Jesus. I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. How many of you guys have done something and you don't know how you had the strength to get through it? Because you fixed your eyes on Jesus. Lord, help me. I can't do this on my own. Lord, help me. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Lord, I've got the biggest test of my life coming up. I can't do it without you. So I put on the full armor of God and we go and we fight Satan. And guess what? Jesus wins every time. He always has and he always will. Hebrews 11, 13 says this. All these people were still living by faith when they died. Talking about Noah and Abraham and all them. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers to this earth. I want to be a stranger to earth. I want to be a foreigner to earth. Why? Because that means that my citizenship is in heaven not here I just reside here for the time being and I love where I live but it's not even nothing compared to what it's going to be like when I receive my mansion in heaven nothing 
And I heard a preacher say the other day, and he says, Do, are we going to recognize each other? Are we going to know each other when we get to heaven? And he says, you're not going to know each other until you get to heaven. Amen. That's when we'll know that true person. The one that lived and persevered the race and kept the faith. But the ones that were witnesses all died with their eyes fixed on Jesus. They're not running with you. They've already finished the race and gone on to their reward. They're not here to judge your performance either. Even though they're gold medalists in the hall of faith. You shouldn't feel nervous that they disgusted in your scars and your limp. We all have scars. We all have limps. Because I can guarantee you somewhere down the line, every person in this building, Satan has beat you to death. You are bruised and battered by the things that Satan is doing to you. But God says, I'm here to heal your wounds and your scars. I'm the only one that can do it. Fight with me. They're not here to cheer you on. I wish they were. Can you, ha can you imagine my buddy Moses up there? He's my favorite of all time. I love Moses. I think he's a great dude. I can, can you imagine Moses up there going, run, Tim, run. They're not here to do that. Why? Because they won their race. We're all in this by ourselves to run together. They're not here to cheer you on. And yes, there's a crowd of other runners. Some might be a little faster. Some might be a little slower. Some a little weaker. Some a little stronger. But I'm not in competition with you for the Lord's favor we don't have to compete against each other when one knows more about the Bible than the other one it doesn't matter because God favors that one just like he does the other one we're all made in the image of God to be like him to love him to have a relationship with him and guess what he doesn't love one person anymore than he loves another aren't you thankful for that amen Hebrews 10 24 says this and let us consider how we must spur one another on towards love and good deeds here's what I think about that verse I'm cheering you on and we're running the race together but here's what I think about that verse when you fall down it's my responsibility to help you get back up and keep running we're in this together it is my responsibility to get the word of God out to you so that you can understand it and that you can call upon him because you love him because he is your Lord and Savior. That's my job. Let's persevere. Let's uh, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let's work on that together as a team. You're not supposed to put your eyes on the people in the crowd and you know, one of the great, uh, great runners of this day, Grant Holloway, um, he went to Grassfoot High School with Brendan, and uh, he's a world champion and, and silver medalist in the Olympics, and he came to visit the school one time, and I said, Grant, what is your secret, man? And he was like, um, it was funny, because I said, what's your secret? And he said, running fast, and I was like, no kidding. He says, no. He says, you never take your eyes off the finish line. He said, Block out everything around you like the horse has, what are those things called? Blinders, blinders on. Blinders. That's why I said blinders. <laughs> blinders, blinders, I don't know. They block people from, you've seen other things. So That's what he said. He says you keep your eye on the finish line. How many of us keep our eyes on the finish line? We're so busy worrying about the obstacles that's put in front of us. We're so busy about those things, that hurdles that they have to jump over all the time. We're looking at those. We're not looking at the finish line. When the Satan puts a hurdle in front of you, jump over it. With your eyes fixed on Jesus. Look at the finish line. Follow the finish line. We're all in this together that we all may end up in heaven with Jesus Christ. What a glorious day that will be. And Hebrews tells us to fix your gaze while you're running your race of faith. Don't fix it on the witnesses in the stand. Fix it on the pioneer and perfecter of faith, and that's Jesus Christ. 
Don't fix your eyes on the runners around you. <coughs> and I asked Gray, and I said, well, well, does the other runners ever distract you? And he, this, this guy's a funny guy, man. He said, no, because they're always behind me. And I'm like, okay, Grant, yeah. But he says, no, you don't fix your eyes on what they're doing. It doesn't matter what they're doing. It matters what you're doing. Never take your eyes off the finish line. Because that's where you're heading. What a great example of what Jesus teaches us. That guy was spitting out scripture and didn't even know it. Never take your eyes off the finish line. Gaze into the pioneer of faith, and that's Jesus Christ. What does it mean when we say he's the pioneer and perfecter of faith? The older translation says he's the author and finisher. It means that he is the beginning and the end of all faith. There's a couple ways to understand this phrase, and they're both correct. First, the Old Testament uh, those are the Old Testament heroes of faith, the great cloud of witnesses in the stands, watching the race and cheering us on with their examples of relentless, persevering faith. They were all living by faith, and then they died in the faith. It says they lived and died looking towards the promise of God to be fulfilled. You see, I have one goal in life, and that's to make it to heaven. My second goal in life is for all of you to make it to heaven. Because Jesus is going to ask me, Tim, what did you do for me? And oh, by the way, Tim, what did you do for Portsmouth Christian Church? You see, I'm being held to a double standard. That should scare me to death. That should make me want to do more. Because it's my responsibility to get you the word. Not only the word, but the truth. Jesus is the perfect example of faith. He never doubted, and he never sinned. And I was hearing this guy uh, battling with, um, if you ever heard Ben Shapiro, uh, he's, if you ain't heard him, you need to listen to him. He's amazing. But a guy was battling with him the other day about God and, and about Jesus, and he says, Jesus did sin. And Ben said, how did he sin? He says, when the sins of the world, he took on the sins of the world, he became sin. No, he did not. He did not. He carried the burdens of sin. Jesus never sinned. What does the Bible say? He became like sin. But he was not sin. Jesus never sinned. Not from the time he was born until he said it is finished on the cross. He never sinned. He bore our sins. He took them upon himself, but he did not sin. And he set that guy straight pretty good. That's why we look at him as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is alive. And seated at the Father's right hand is the perfect example of how God rewards faith. It just amazes me that God will do the same thing for us that he did for his own son. We get rewarded just like Jesus did. Why? Because we're called heirs to the kingdom. We become children of God. Was Jesus not a child of God? Yes, he was his son. We are children just like he is. So God will reward us just like he did his son. That ought to blow your mind. That, G, that God loves us as much as he loved his own son. That amazes me. Put that into proportion. I don't know if you can. Because I know he loved his son. But he says, Tim, I love you too. But you've got to run the race. You've got to persevere. You've got to keep your eyes fixed on who? My son, Jesus. Keep your eyes on the finish line Jesus is the ground of our faith and also the goal of it Ephesians 2 8 through 10 says for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is a gift of God not by works so that no one can boast for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are saved by grace by what? By faith. What do we have faith in? That Jesus is who he says he was. He did what he said he did. He died upon the cross. He was resurrected. And by his blood, we are saved by grace. That's what we believe in here at Portsmouth Christian Church. If you got any other way to be saved, let me know because I ain't found it yet. We're saved by God's amazing grace. Because he has grace for us. He convicts us through his Holy Spirit. And his love for us never ends. Even though when the, when the devil makes the waters go wrong and the winds blow and we start to sink, God says, I'm right here with you. I got you. Keep your eyes focused on him and the finish line. He is the only one that can sustain our faith for us. Look at Philippians 1.6. It says, being confident of this. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion of the day of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means that he will never set a goal for you that he will not help you complete. If he makes a path for you, he will walk down that path with you. He will never lead you to failure. He is there for us. He has set a good work for us and he will help us to carry it on until completion. Until we cross that finish line. And you may say, well, Tim, I, I'm just scared sometimes to take that leap. I, I'm scared to, to, to run that race. I'm scared to go over that hurdle. I don't know if I can complete that hurdle. Guess what? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know, I'm looking at the finish line, but I also see this hurdle up here, and I'm really anxious about it. Cast your anxieties upon Christ. He will help you hurdle that. You know, I'm going down this road of darkness, and there's a big speed bump here. Cast your anxieties upon him, and he will carry you through. Stop worrying about things you don't need to be worried about. Cast your anxieties on him. His shoulders are big enough to take it. He will see you through. Throw off the sin that so easily entangles you. How do you do that? By repenting of your sins. Every day or every Sunday when I take um, a communion, one of the things I say before I take communion is, God, please forgive me of any sin that I've committed. Why? Because I want a pure and clean heart when I drink his blood and bite his body. I repent of my sins. Confess your sins. It's okay to open up. Because why? Because he knows about it anyway. Throw off your sin that easily entangles you. Confess it. And the Bible says that he is for, uh, faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. In reality, all your sin and misery are already laid on him at the cross. So confess and lean on him. Throw off everything that hinders you of sin, including people. If someone's keeping you from a deeper relationship in Christ, cut it off. Say, I just, you know, I love you, but I can't be in this environment. Because when I'm in this environment, I can't focus on Jesus. I got to focus on what's going on because I'm not sure about things. Cast them off. Are you doing something you shouldn't be doing? Cast it off. Because that's keeping you from focusing on Jesus. Why? Because it's doing things that is pleasing to who? Yourself. We cannot please God and ourselves at the same time, guys. I can promise you that 100%. Perfect example when you're committing adultery. If you're laying with that other person, you're not pleasing God. You're pleasing yourself. Self-pleasure never lasts. God's pleasure never dies. He's always there. The pioneer and perfecter of your faith, sustaining you with his own spirit, encouraging you with internal joy to have you with him when you've endured, persevered, 
and finish the race. And yes, you'll find that when you reach the finish line, just like Glenn Cunningham, you've picked up some Olympic medals and set some records. But you'll know you didn't win with them because your legs are so strong. It was only with Jesus that you finished the race. I asked this morning that if you don't know Jesus, man, he is just amazing. Um, I don't know how to ever to describe Jesus except amazing, phenomenal, um, just full of grace, full of mercy. <laughs> if you don't know him this morning, I just ask that you come up and let's change that. It's easy. It's very easy. I pray that if you know Jesus and, and you think you're walking away from him, let's just come up and pray that you can battle Satan who's causing you to think this way. I pray that if you're in need of a healing this morning or, or something going on in your life, I just pray that you come up and let's pray about it because God wants to do good things for you. I believe that, that God is up there saying, please ask me, please ask me, please ask me. Because he says we don't receive. Why? Because we don't ask. Well, that's not that bad. You know, somebody else is worse off than I am. You know, uh, you know, I, I've only got a little pain or, or a little this or a little that. God wants to heal you. He wants to take care of you. So I just pray that if you have a prayer and a need this morning that you need, just come up and let's pray. I'll give you a minute.
Lord, we know it's all because of you. Lord, we are in a desperate race. And uh, sometimes we feel like our legs are weak and our minds are weak, our bodies are weak. So, Father, I ask that when we are weak, that you make us strong. Let us never take our eyes off the finish line and focus evil on you and your way. Father, I pray for Katie and Dawn as they are coming home tomorrow. I pray that you will give them safe travels, that you will give them good weather, uh, that you would just surround them with your, your purpose and your grace. Father, I pray for Bridget as she's coming home. Lord, I pray that you watch over her, that you keep her in your arms. Lord, you bring her here safe. Father, I pray for all those that are traveling, for Crystal, who is going to um, a funeral. I pray for her safe travels, but I pray that you watch over her family as she's gone, that you will put a hedge of protection over them. Father, I pray that uh, when Crystal gets there, that when her family asks questions, that she will have the right words. That, Lord, she'll be able to speak and not even understand what she's saying because the words are coming from the Holy Spirit, not from her. Speak through her. Father, I pray for any unspoken prayer here today, Lord, that you would lift up your hands to them. If there's one who is not saved, Lord, that you would touch them and convict their hearts. Lord, I pray for this church, that we will stay true to your word and never flounder or waver from what your word says. Never be, let us be scared of an obstacle that Satan puts in our way because we know that we have the full armor of God that we can fight it. Watch over us, Lord, protect us by your mercy and your grace. For we love you and you deserve all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.